All right. Uh, so, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here on a Friday in the middle of the day. Uh, I know a lot of you have busy schedules, so great that you're here. Uh, and Maurice, thanks, you know, the most for you being here. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time out uh, to sort of educate us on your journey and, and everything. Uh, so Maurice, um, you know, really cool guy. Um, I've always, you know, had a smile on my face after talking to him because he's always just so nice and pleasant. Um, and he is the owner of uh, Epic Receptionist, uh, which I believe was started as a, re a direct result of uh, joining Call Center Cast and joining the tribe. Um, and uh, I don't want to say too much. I, I'd rather, you know, leave the story about you uh, to you. Uh, so again, welcome and thanks for being here, man. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. I appreciate it. Uh, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so if you could tell me, tell you know the audience a little bit about who you are and uh, what you're currently doing. Sure. So like you already said, my name is Maurice Williams, um, owner of Epic Receptionist. Have been in business since September of last year, technically since September. We actually didn't start operations until January of this year. Uh, yeah, not sure what else you want me to say about that. I can go further into my <laughs> background and company background if you want. Yeah, tell, tell us a bit about your, your background. You know, I guess tell us a little bit about maybe what about your background led you to uh, wanting to get into this space. Sure. That is actually a very long story. I don't know if we have enough time in the day, but I'll try and summarize it. <laughs> um, so my background is mostly technology. Uh, I've been working in software for um, a little bit over a decade, probably like 12 to 13 years. Um, I've always worked for some sort of like giant company in the past, but on the side, I've always had like a side hustle, if you may. Um, even though I've been working in technology for 13 years, I've been like freelancing for more than half of that. So like I would, I get night, I would always do some type of freelance project. Um, always tried to like start companies with friends or like try to make money off a of side project, stuff like that. So that's kind of like my, my general background. Um, I've always been interested in small businesses and startups. Um, one of my bucket list items was to actually start my own company. So this definitely helps with that. Um, nice. In terms of how I got to this specifically, uh, it's going to sound like a kind of a roundabout way, but two years ago, um, I had maybe two and a half. I had I didn't even know that this industry existed. Um, I originally wanted to start a co-working space, which is something I still want to do eventually. Um, I've always been a participant in co-working, like I've gone to co-working spaces, but I've never operated one myself. So I spent about the better part of a year exploring what it means to be a co-working space owner operator. Um, really? Visited a, visited a whole bunch of co-working spaces, um, Colorado, San Diego, New York, um, here in Michigan, whole bunch of them. Um, it is very expensive to start a co-working space because uh, you need physical property. <laughs> um, and my whole thing was I wanted to differentiate my space. What, not... want, what was that? Oh, sorry, my bad. I'm uh, I'm not muted. Oh, I'm at, <laughs> I thought you were asking I'm at work. Question. Maurice, I'm listening yeah. to you, man. I support you. I love you, man. Keep telling your story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to meet you now, yeah. Nathan. <laughs> love the energy. So I was trying to find ways to differentiate my co-working space from just being like, you rent the desk, you come and you leave, right? Um, so I thought there's all these other additional business services I could offer, such as like a uh, virtual secretary or like picking up food, stuff like that. Um, and I told myself, this was in 2019, I told myself in 2020, I'm going to start a company of some sort. I didn't know if it was gonna be the co-working space specifically, I was gonna do something, right? Cause co-working space is a big endeavor, but maybe I could start like one of these ancillary services and then use money from that down the road to start the co-working space. Um, then COVID happened. So that kind of put a pause on everything. Anything that had to do with the physical space was obviously out of the picture. That was like February, March. And I was like, okay, the co-working thing is definitely not happening this year. Um, 
any of the other options that I was thinking of wasn't going to happen. Um, so I was kind of in a funk at the beginning of, of 2020 for sure. Um, so I want to say around June, maybe around June of 2020, I essentially just told myself like, well, just sitting here whining about it isn't going to do anything, right? Like I was a little bit unhappy with myself. So I like just felt like my plans aren't going to work out. I was like, well, there's a million other business options out there. I don't have to just stick to this one that I had in mind. I could still do something else and meet this goal. Um, so I started looking for other ideas. Uh, I still wanted them to kind of support this co-working idea. So I was looking at, okay, ancillary services that I originally planned to offer, how could I maybe offer those without the physical space? Um, so I originally started looking at laundry delivery services, which don't do it. It is uh, very not profitable. <laughs> um, I probably spent about a month looking into that. Like, how could I make it work from a business perspective? My original idea was almost like Uber for laundry services. So like, we'll pick up your laundry once or twice a week. We, I could like make a deal with laundry mats or something. Um, long story short, it wouldn't work. The margins are like not present. There's no big demand for laundry services. Um, I thought that because a lot of parents are working from home and their kids were, were going to be home, like, oh, yeah, you still need these things to get done. Um, Not a whole lot of laundry getting done uh, for dress shirt during the pandemic. <laughs> nope, nope, not a lot. There is one company that's been doing laundry delivery services for a while, um, but they own a chain of laundry mats, and they essentially just have trucks that take it to their own laundry mat. So even trying to compete with them would be like very, very difficult because the demand is already very low and they already have like a pretty good hold of that market. So I was like, okay, that's not going to happen. Um, so that was like the first idea I was like exploring. Um, and then one day I was on Reddit and I kind of came across a post that I forget what sub it was in, but someone had just said like, um, once the pandemic is over, what business do people plan to start or something like that? And you weren't the one that created the post, but you responded in it saying that um, you would create a virtual receptionist company because you like recently sold it and you'd probably just do one again. And I was like, oh, I've never, I've never heard of this virtual receptionist option. But one of the things I wanted to offer in my co-working space was like a virtual assistant, like I'm much more familiar with the VA concept. Um, so I started looking into it I found companies like, you know, Ruby Receptionist and Lex. That's like the first ones that come up when you Google that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I essentially just like messaged you and I was like, can you tell me a bit more about this? <laughs> um, and I guess the rest is just, just history, right? Like it's just started snowballing from there. Um, I realized there, there is a demand for people that need their phones answered. Um, it wasn't specific to any one industry. I mean, it could be, right? You can niche to single industry but you're not limited to like geographical location or specific industry or specific technology, which is what also made it very appealing. And you don't really have to convince people they have a need for this because mm -hmm. if you're a small business owner and your phone's ringing all the time, you already know you have the problem versus like laundry delivery or co-working space. You kind of have to like attract people to it, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. That's a absolutely uh awesome story and, 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 and a big point. Uh, you know, a lot of times when we're out prospecting, most of the prospecting is just educating them on what it is we're actually offering. And then once there's an understanding there, it's like, oh, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Right, um, exactly. And since okay. I don't really have a background in sales, that really attracted me to it because it was like, I don't have to be salesy, so to speak. Like you said, there's not a lot of the education process the education portion of the sales process is very short because it's very easy to understand what it is we offer right well awesome so uh you know so you you basically i, I think you did sort of register your company around september um, i did i actually just looked it up september 23rd is okay. when the registration went through in michigan okay all right um and then you ended up sort of launching in january uh, tell me about your first few months, I guess, beginning from January. Yep. So first few months were rough. 
Um, my original plan was to launch around Thanksgiving, but that obviously did not happen. Uh, one of the reasons was we did have a death in the family at the end of that month. Um, so I had to fly out of the country to kind of help my family with that stuff. So I had to like delay everything till, till January. Um, so I had like ads and stuff running. And, and uh, you grew up in, is it Colombia? Uh, close, Panama. Hmm. Yeah, so one country north of Colombia. Yeah. So I had to fly down to Panama for like two weeks um, and help my family out with like funeral arrangements, which kind of whole different ball of wax. Um, so then fast forward to January, um, started operating everything, uh, started doing interviews for people, like hiring receptionists um, that first week of January as well. I ended up hiring two people um, to kind of help cover just hours, basically. <clears throat> Excuse me. My original operating hours were going to be from nine to five. That's kind of what I wanted to start with. Um, one thing I should have prefaced this with is that I still currently have a day job. Um, so I didn't like quit my job to do this. I'm doing this on top of my job. So I knew that I wouldn't be able to personally answer the phones all the time. So I needed somewhere that, someone there that was able to do that. So I started doing the interviews. And actually, that's part of the reason why I wanted to interview you today as well, because, you know, there's a lot of people that are approaching this and they still have a job. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of wonder as to whether or not you can get any type of traction while still having your, your day job. So, yep. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm fortunate to be, I've been working remote even before COVID, probably close to three or four years I've been working remote, like fully remote. Um, so like my company, the company that I work for has already had like all their processes and stuff to find when the whole remote work happened. And like, I was comfortable working in a remote environment already. Um, but anyways, the first few months of receptionists were rough. Uh, up until March, I would say, I was like, I'm not sure if this is going to work out. I'm not sure how much longer <laughs> this is going to go. Um, so we didn't get our first paying customer until end of March, maybe first week of April. I have to go back and look. But like by mid-February, I told myself, if by middle of April, we have nothing, like, I guess that's it, right? Like <laughs> I've spent four months on this, got no traction. Maybe that's it. Um, and then of course, right, middle to end of March, we got our first person and then that just like reinvigorated me. Like I felt like, oh yeah, we can do this. Um, and now we're up to 23, 23 paying, paying clients. Fantastic. Um, and so, you know, that that's, it's a, it's a huge thing. You know, I think there's a lot of people that, that come through the program or really just invest or consider any new venture. Uh, and the reason why I believe most people that want to be entrepreneurs or are currently entrepreneurs is because if things don't work out early on, they just sort of throw in the towel to have too early. Yep. Uh, so, you know, there is a little bit of luck in that. Uh, oh, you were for able sure. To, yeah. And that yeah. you were able to find that first client a little bit before you threw in the towel, but uh, you certainly lasted longer in terms of those initial efforts than most people do. Um, so tell me a little bit about uh, what changed after you landed your first client. Um, I don't remember. Well, there's a bunch of stuff that's changed from my original plan to now. So for starters, our hours are not nine to five anymore. They're actually 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and we also do weekends from 12 to 8, also Eastern time. Yeah. Um, and a lot of those hour changes were to accommodate customers, like as I spoke to more people. Um, we have a couple of folks that are on the West Coast. So that kind of made us extend beyond 5 p.m. Eastern. And then we have a client right now, I don't remember how many minutes they do per month. Um, they're on the larger side, but they get about 10 calls on the weekends, like 10 on Saturday, 10 on Sunday. So we started offering weekend hours specifically for them. And it turns out other clients also were interested in that. Um, so that kind of worked out. But going back to your original question of what changed when we got the, our first client, 
um i would say but, my energy oh go ahead yeah yeah i know you said it reinvigorated you and yeah i was want to say my energy levels for sure because i just felt like this is actually possible now right like I know it's just one person and they were only paying a hundred dollars a month, which doesn't cover <laughs> what I was spending. But to me, it felt like I hit the lottery. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it definitely felt that I was like top of the world. Cause I've tried to do um, other like software based ventures before and they never really go anywhere. So like, this is very different than what I've tried before. Cause this is like a purely service based um, company. So, so like, I'm sorry. Uh, what that, so that client, was that your first time landing a client outside of, you know, freelancing ever? Yes, that was wow. the first time I've won the client outside of freelancing ever. That is correct. Yep. Okay. So yeah, that's definitely a pivotal moment and congratulations on that. Yeah. Like um, I said, it felt like they were paying me a million dollars. Those first hundred dollars they gave me as like, oh, this is, this is incredible. Like a stranger is trusting me to do this for them. This feels so good. Yeah. That's absolutely incredible. And, you know, honestly, uh, you know, I, you know, if you do other things in the future, that first client is always a uh, pivotal moment. Um, mm -hmm. Even if you know it's going to happen, there's some type of sigh of relief at the absolute minimum when that first sort of transaction comes through. Um, and so, you know, so you went from the one to uh, 23 clients in the last like four months. <laughs> um, yep what was your, how did your strategy develop in terms of client acquisition? Um, so I think it's really my messaging is probably what ended up getting tweaked um, to kind of help like get more clients. Uh, I was much more, in hindsight, I was, the way I was messaging, it was much more like, hey, here's what we offer, right? Like we can answer your phones and book your appointments as opposed to framing it more around like a problem. Like, are you too busy missing customers? We can help you not miss customers, or you know, we can help you catch those customers you're missing by answering your phone calls and booking your appointments. So as opposed to like leading with the solution, it was more like, here's a problem I think you're having. Here's what I can do to help with that problem. Versus initially it was just like, hey, we answer phones. Let me answer your phone. <laughs> right, right. That's yeah. it. At first, it's like you're yelling out into an empty room, um, yep. and now it's like just sort of approaching people in a in a in a way to speak to them. Uh, so tell me, tell me a bit, and you know, you can be as specific or as non-specific as you like. But what is your typical process now for landing a client? Uh, you mean like finding the prospect, or like once I already found them and I'm talking with them? Everything. <laughs> okay. So for the most part, where I actually find most of my prospects is actually on Upwork. So I actually went back to like my freelancing roots, if you may. <laughs> um, I'm familiar with the Upwork platform. I'm fairly comfortable with it. And a friend of mine sent me a video a while back. I don't know the name of the, the person in the video, but they use this term, which is like buyers in heat. Um, and we use that term all the time now because on Upwork, you essentially have a bunch of people that are buyers in heat because they're already, they already know they have a problem. They're looking to fix the problem. I don't have to like ask them, hey, do you have this problem? Here's how I can solve it. Um, so the moment someone responds to me, basically, um, and I haven't gotten all my clients from Upwork. I'd say the majority have been, but I've gotten Upwork, some from cold emails. And I think two of them have been referrals. Um, the one thing that has not worked for me, which I tried in the beginning was cold calling. I just never had any luck with that for whatever reason. Um, yeah. And, and I think it can be difficult sometimes. Uh, one, if you don't have a big sales background and then two, uh, you know, if, if your messaging in the beginning wasn't as, as effective as it is now. Yeah. I haven't tried cold calling since I adjusted the way like I express the service basically. Um, so I might try that again in the future to see how that goes. Um, but yeah, once I, you know, that's usually how I find the prospect. So then once I'm in touch with this person, I'm talking with them, um, everyone always wants to start off by asking like, well, what's your price and what do you do? And the first thing I try to do is turn that conversation around about like, well, what are you looking for, right? 
what hurts? Tell me what your problem is. And then everyone loves to talk about themselves. So that usually is just like 15 minutes of them talking about their company and what they're looking for and what they want to do and what they would do and what's working, what's not working. And I'm like, great, here's how I think we can fit in to what you said. Here's where I think, here's what we can't do with what you said. Um, and then we usually talk about stuff just from there. So I try to like insert the services we add around the problems that they say that they, they have. Um, and then usually leave pricing for like the middle, not the very end, but like, yeah. Once they tell me, here's what they'd like to do. And they're like, here's how I think we can fit in. Um, then we usually start talking about pricing at that point. That's fantastic. And, you know, just typically a, like a phone call or a Zoom call, like when you have a completely new person that responds to what do you, what type of. It's typically a Zoom call. Yeah, I think I've had less than half of them have been phone calls, but yeah, it's usually a Zoom call. Okay. All right. That's awesome. And, you know, the beautiful thing that came out of the pandemic really is the uh, normalization of Zoom calls, right? Yep. Um, you know, people, there's a benefit to being on video in general that they can have much more of a potential report, especially if you're showing your face. Um, and, you know, there, it's very powerful to have what it's almost an in-person sort of impact on a prospect as opposed to just calling them on the phone and particularly over email. Yeah. Yeah, the first, I'd say the first five or six clients I landed were all initial Zoom conversations. Um, the first person I landed through a cold email, I actually thought they were like a scammer because like they didn't want to talk because <laughs> they responded to the cold email being like, oh, this sounds great. I have an accounting business. Um, I need someone to answer my phones. And I was like, awesome, here's my availability. We can talk as soon as like later today or tomorrow morning, just let me know. And he was like, nope, I just want to sign up. And I'm like, this is really suspicious. Like, this just sounds weird. I was like, okay, I'll, like, what harm do I have with him filling out my sign up form? It can't hurt me. So he filled it out. I sent him the call handling template. We did the first week trial. He actually sent us phone calls. He actually ended up paying for three months in advance after the trial. And I'm like, oh, I guess he's real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I'm glad that you had that sort of like that little extra uh, logic that kicked in. I, I think a lot of time when people are doing things, especially early on, they sometimes they have a process as to how they think the uh, potential sale is going yes. to go. And they put a little bit too much space between uh, the, you know, introduction and the sale. So like, I'm glad you realized that if the prospect is asking for you to, to pay you. If they're asking to pay you, just get out of the way, let them pay you. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And I, like I said, I was hesitant at first. I'm like, why does this guy not want to get on the phone? Why is he so eager to sign up? Like, this just sounds weird to me. Um, in hindsight, the reason is probably, I mean, maybe this person has used answering services before, and maybe it's not a new concept to him, but this was a new concept to me. So I was thinking, yeah, I have to kind of walk people through like, hey, we answer phones and here's how it works. But this guy was probably like, I really know how it works. Just tell me how to get started. <laughs> Yeah, very good. Yeah. And and to this day, I don't think I've I've never spoken to him on the phone ever. It's all it's all just emails. No, to the best clients. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I, it, very quickly, I had one person that I, I met at a car wash, didn't talk about the business at all, uh, and then he found me on LinkedIn. And he's like, "Hey, is this your business?" And I simply say, "Yeah," and he just went and signed up. Um, hmm. And, you know, with a client for over two years, never talked to him <laughs> other nice. than to thank him for signing up. Yeah. Uh, um, so, yeah. So, you know, now that you've been able to get some traction and uh, you've got a certain amount of, of clients, uh, maybe if you could learn three things that you learned over the process of operating, like actually operating the last four months, uh, that maybe you didn't anticipate or uh, expect going into it. Um, I know I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, so I have two things for sure that I've looked back and been like, yeah, that was definitely a mistake. Or, and there's one that I'm like, I'll never do that. And I'm like, yep, here I am doing that. 
<laughs> um, so the one thing I've definitely learned in the process is to remain flexible because going into this, I'm trying to think, how do I phrase this? So with my freelance experience, my big thing is always um, don't just let like a freelance client bully you into doing something, right? Um, especially with software, sometimes they're like, oh, you spent four hours doing that? That should have been two hours, right? Like, don't let them do that. Because uh, at that point, you're simply like lose control of like your billable hours. Um, so going into this, my thought was, don't let a customer dictate like how you run your company or what your company does or what services it offers. Um, but that was actually a mistake <laughs> or well, it could have been a mistake because originally I would always say like, we can take your, we can answer your phone calls and book appointments as long as like your calendar is publicly accessible. Like we won't log into your system. Um, but we actually log into quite a bit of different systems today. So I think those would have been customers that we would have missed um, if that was the case. Um, we have one client that does close to 1500 minutes a month, which when they originally signed up, they wanted us to do like troubleshooting for them almost. They sell, um, what is it? They're like uh, diagnostics machines for veterinary offices. I mean, it's a limited amount. They sell like three or four different machines. And originally when they were signing up, they're like, oh, we just want you to ask these like troubleshooting questions because sometimes it's just a matter of like, they pushed the wrong button. And at first I was like, oh, I don't know about this. Like, we are not experts in this machine. We've never touched it. And I was like, okay, we'll do a trial. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, before they started the trial, they're like, you know what? We don't want you to, to ask those questions. We want you to only do call transfers. And that's all we do for them now. It's only transfers. Um, so if I had to- they're doing 1,500 minutes a month on just- On just calls. transfers, yeah. That they're is. like eight people over there and yeah, they get a lot of calls. So if I had said up front, like, oh, that's too complicated. I don't know if we can do that. It would have never, like that deal would have never happened. Right, so your willingness to sort of, you know, sort of try to work things out, uh, got them in the door. Yes. And uh, now that they're working with you and there's an established like actual transactional business relationship, uh, you got to work out a win-win scenario for both sides. Yep, exactly. That's so kind happen. of remaining flexible with like what you're willing to do with a customer, I'd say it's definitely a, a lesson learned. Okay. Definitely. Um, in terms of what not to do, uh do not pay a marketing agency to run ads for you up front because it's terrible it's i mean i might as well just like throwing that money into the fire pit is what it seemed like <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes you're right you did try telling me um i spent two or two and a half months uh i won't say what company name it was if anyone cares they can message me and i'll tell them the full breakdown, but I spent like two and a half months running ads through like a marketing agency. And I know like it's not gonna be magic, right? I didn't expect overnight for them to have like a hundred people knocking at my, my inbox or whatever. But in two and a half months, they generated two leads. And I was like, well, this is ridiculous. Um, now, oh. you, you might be saying, well, there could have been other problems, right? Like maybe your website wasn't great, whatever, but they actually control the whole experience. They ran the ads, they put up a phone number like in the ads that goes through them so they can track it. And they put up like a microsite which their ads link to their website. Um, yeah, like a squeeze page. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I probably spent like three grand or four grand over those two and a half months for like two leads. And the first month I was like, I didn't expect to get anything out of it the first month because like the campaign's ramping up, they have to like adjust stuff, I get it. By the second month, because we used to meet every two weeks, by the second month, I was like, guys, what's going on? Like there's <laughs> there's nothing here. They're like, oh, you know, these things still take time, just figuring it out, blah, blah, blah. And like, yeah, halfway through the third month is like, this is ridiculous. I've burnt through so much money. You guys have gotten me absolutely zero. Um, I've had more, I got more traction cold calling like people interested even though they didn't convert mm -hmm. then i did paying the agency and i was like never again <laughs> never again 
Yeah, you know, one thing I'll say uh, just really quickly about that is uh, one, it is difficult to, uh, it is difficult to run ads in this space unless you have a pretty good understanding specifically of the virtual receptionist space and you, you know what you're doing within that. And then two, if you're not uh, very established as a company yet, right? Could do, there'll be some, some impressions and people will start to potentially look into your company, but there's not a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot not. of those leads are just gonna convert to the competitors and they'll, they'll never reach out to you. Uh, so I, I do think that there's a lot different results um, when you have a bit more of an established company, you got some reviews, you've got articles posted on different spots on the web. It allows people to, in their initial due diligence, to find you. Yeah, um, that's a good point. I actually did not think about that because, I mean, at that point we were brand new. So if they looked in just a tiny bit, they would have found like a Facebook page with two posts that's maybe two <laughs> months old, an Instagram account with nothing. Like, <laughs> so yes, there's, there was definitely not much presence out there at all. Yeah. Um, okay, and uh, so that's two points. Um, you know, definitely don't blow a bunch of money on ads starting off and make sure that, especially starting off, you're as flexible as possible. Uh, any other learnings? Um, I don't know if this is necessarily a learning, but one thing that I know I definitely wouldn't be able to get to this point without is be somewhat particular when you're hiring your first agent, or at least your first two agents. Um, one of my agents today, his name is Jacoby, um, rock star. I mean, like, yeah, I, I could not have continued to do some of the certain things that I've been able to do if I didn't have like a good agent to start with. That was my second agent hire. I, I hired two agents that first week of January. Um, yeah, I just mean like he's super willing to do new things or like jump in and help with stuff or give suggestions. Um, while I've had other agents that have not worked out where they're just like, oh, someone called, they asked about this, but it wasn't in the script. So I didn't know what to do. It's like, oh, come on. Like <laughs> think a little bit, like just a little bit of effort. So if like I had someone like that on day one, it would have not, like it would have not worked. There's no way. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I certainly agree with you. I think having an incredible core uh, is the backbone of, uh, of a successful business. Yep. Um, you know, having, because you're a solo founder as well, uh, having yep. someone that you can sort of bounce things off of and that can give you a, an actual perspective uh, and then a perspective from the standpoint of someone that actually cares, <laughs> um, it can be absolutely invaluable. So great yeah. point. Yeah. And I told the people like when I hired them up front, I told them this is a brand new venture. I've never run a company before. I've never been in this industry before. So like, if you're willing to take a risk with me, right? Like I will, like, I will be forever grateful. And like, if this company blows up, like, you can ride the rocket ship with me if it comes down to that. Um, and yeah, the first people I hired were completely, completely up to that. There's some folks that I interviewed that they're like, oh yeah, I don't know if I can do that. And I'm like, that's fine. Like, that's, that's why I'm telling you. No, that's fantastic. Setting expectations. I think there's a lot of people, um, it's sort of impossible when you're hiring your first person, but I think there's a lot of people that try to present themselves as more put together than they are. Yep. But, um, you know, uh, what I've found, frankly, in my early years, I was guilty of this. Um, but what I've found is that the more authentic and upfront you are with people and, and really any interaction, uh, the better they respond because they can either, you know, again, you're either speaking to someone and what they were actually looking for, or you are manipulating or, you know, um, baiting someone into something that isn't going to make sense and then they'll be upset right. and, and it just won't work out long term. Yep. Um, so, you know, so where you are at now, um, you know, you're, 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 you're getting some traction. Uh, I'm assuming you're getting some, some profit. 
Um, Not a lot of profit, but profit is there. Yes. <laughs> that's good. Good. Um, and again, you know, four months from your first client, uh, where would you say you are now? And what do you anticipate or maybe expect or what are your goals for the next six months? <laughs> Well, my goal for the next six months, one thing I would like to do is focus more like a particular niche. Um, so right now we kind of, I mean, if you want to take our business, we'll, if you want to give me your business, we'll take your business, right? We're not, we're not focused on one particular industry. Um, there is an industry that I'm kind of leaning towards. There's like two of them. One is they are higher volume, but lower um, ticket price, so to speak, um, which is like the salon industry. So like their calls are relatively simple, but there's usually a good amount of them. Um, and then the other industry I'd consider the niche into is maybe something more medical focused, um, either like chiropractors or dentists or whatever, something like that. Because the benefit of that is you can charge them more because I think they're just willing to pay more. Um, but I don't think they'll have as many calls that might be like more complicated, but that's getting too deep into it. But my plan for the next six months is like figure out a niche, to like really just like go down into. Um, beyond that, once we get one thing that's like niche focused, I'd like to just like, ideally I'd find a formula that works and just like repeat that formula for like other industry specific stuff yeah so that's good i mean you know you essentially you're um, in a sense you're sort of phasing out of phase one right or let's say phase two phase one is you're trying to get your first client phase two is getting some type of traction and like uh you know having uh proof of concept in terms of your ability to own and operate this business which now you yep. have that phase three is okay, now we need to start to go down the path of creating a, a, a true sustainable business. And um, as a tip for you guys watching uh, either now or in the future on this recording, um, especially since Mauricio joined backend stuff, logging into people's backend, uh, niching will make your life operationally a lot easier. Um, you sort of mentioned that you're starting to take on more and more backend. Yep. Well, you know, if you're in 30 different industries, and I dealt with this, if you're in 30 different industries, you're going to have probably triple or, or more the amount of back end that you might have to know how to navigate for your agents. Uh, but if you're in a few industries, you can sort of nail that and your agent will be left brain tired over the course of the day. Uh, the jargon within each industry, uh, there'll be less sort of particulars and nuances to them that they'll have to know because you're dealing with less industry and just operationally the problems that come up within industry tend to be somewhat similar uh and so if you're dealing with the same thing over and over again you're more equipped to deal with it in a, a better way um so over the next six months uh your goal is to start to streamline into a few niches awesome niches by the way um, how do you feel just in general, like, you know, being a business owner, uh, and, you know, I don't know if you have thought about the next, uh, several years in terms of where you want to be. Um, I, I have not thought about it too much. Um, so I do know this won't be my forever company. So I'm not looking to like run this for the next 20 years, so to speak. So at some point, I think I'll either sell the company or maybe fold it in to a new company. So like I said at the beginning, I still have this goal of like running a co-working space. So it's possible that like this ends up being like the co-working space is like the main thing. And then like, this is like a additional service offered to like co-working members, which happens to be able to like sustain itself. Mm -hmm. um, so even if I, I'll use, I'll say own this company for a long time, I definitely won't be the one operating it. Um, forever but good good so i you know i hope this, this sort of uh helps you segue into that right um have you thought about uh where the co-working space would be more recently uh i have not not too well i had a space in mind near me at one point 
Um, but since then, the restaurant has taken it. But restaurants don't do very well in that spot, so, so I don't know if they'll be there for too long. Um, I mean, I've been in the town I'm in in Michigan for about eight years, and like four different restaurants have been there in eight years, and it sat empty for like a year and a half. Um, so I still kind of have my eye on that spot. But no, I haven't put like any concrete thoughts in terms of like exactly where it would be. Okay, all right. Well, uh, that's cool. Um, I think my video cut for just a quick second there. So, you know, I, I want to try to get as many gems as we can here. And again, I appreciate your time. And we'll go into a question and answer in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I guess the, the last thing I'd like to ask here is if you were to give a couple pieces of advice, you know, let's say two pieces of advice to someone that is considering getting into this space, um, you know, and either from a new business owner perspective or from the call center perspective, what would you say to them? The two pieces. Oh, one sec. Oh, interesting. Sorry, yeah, I guess I was sorry, muted. I muted you instead of myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the two pieces of advice I would give um, would be don't give up too early. Uh, like I said at the beginning, it was very rough. Like I'd spend some nights in bed thinking, like, I don't know, man. I don't know if this is going to work. But <laughs> so, like, I could see very easily after a month, someone might just give up if they're thinking, oh, I put a whole month into this, it didn't work, I'm on to the next thing. Um, so don't don't quit too soon. Um, and I guess along those same lines is like, be willing to try different things. Um, the second piece of advice would be try to define some sort of process or system for things upfront. So with remaining flexible in terms of like taking on new things that we do for, for clients, before I jump into it and be like, oh yeah, we can totally do that. I would at least figure out like operationally, how would that happen, right? Like, okay, great. You want us to log into your backend and do something. Um, how am I going to like get that link to the agents? How are we going to manage those passwords for them? How are they going to still be able to do this while talking in the phone call as opposed to just being like, oh, we'll figure it out on the fly. Um, Cause those are the things that at least help me be less stressed out. Like I can at least give my my two initial agents like, here's an outline of how I think this could flow. Let's work through this and see like what gaps need to be need to be filled in. Yeah. So planning for new things that you take on and don't don't give up too soon. I think would be my two pieces of advice. Yeah, fantastic pieces of advice. Um, you know, again, Maurice, I I, I really appreciate you being on here, man. Um, uh, you know. I think when it comes to, um, it, it is a little bit of like a post-pull scenario, right? Like you do have to be as flexible as you can uh, because one, it's about figuring out if you can do this. Like intellectually, mm -hmm. you might know this thing's gonna work, like theoretically. But as you start to reach out to people and you start to get some bites, uh, there are specific clients that have specific needs that happen to have selected you. Uh, so it's like, okay, well, how do I figure out how to best serve them and therefore have a company and, and you know, get to solvency? Uh, and so, yeah, you do have to figure out a way to serve them and make them happy while also being able to keep your company together in the right way so yes. that it's still a foundation that you can build off of. Yep. Yeah. One mistake that I did make, this will be a small, a small story. Um, so two of my clients actually have dedicated agents. One of them came from the very beginning knowing they want dedicated agents, right? That was, that was fine. The other one actually came in wanting to follow the shared agent model. And we did a one week trial with them. And I told them, this is not possible. Like the type of calls you get does no. not work with this model. Um, it was more customer service type calls. Mm. So, th I mean, those phone calls can be like eight to 10 minutes long. Mm. And I was like, there's no way with shared agents that that's going to work, right? Like it might work for at, them. At least not early on. Right? right, exactly. It might work for them, but for me operationally, like it's impossible. I had three agents when that person first came on mm -hmm. and like two of them would be tied up in calls while one of them's handling everything else for like the, the shared clients. Mm -hmm. 
So I just told him, like, I don't know if that's going to work for us. Like, we can't, like, like you would tank my business, basically, right? Like, operationally, you would tank it. <laughs> um, but then he was open to the idea of also having, like, dedicated agents for him, like, just doing his customer service stuff, um, which took the pressure off my agents, but then put pressure on me because I had to hire someone, like, in a week, like, like very, very quickly <laughs> mm-hmm. to fill that position. Yeah, that's good. I don't know if, if I can even call that a mistake, right? Like, you know, uh, maybe you didn't recognize at first that uh, it would be operationally very difficult. Yeah, I did not. I felt like, oh, yeah, we can definitely handle that. Like, it shouldn't be too bad. But right. yeah, I was wrong. Yeah, so being, being um, willing to tell a customer, hey, this isn't working before they get exasperated and, and just quit, and then offering a solution where, hey, we'd love to help you, but you're going to have to do it this way. Yep. Um, you know, that's a great way to sort of expand upon that relationship that you've already got because you said, you know, let's try it. Yep. Because my big thing, and this is even before I started this company, but I've always believed that, like, if you keep your employees happy, they will make your customers happy and therefore your business will do well. Um, versus I know like the more old school way of thinking is like the customer's always right. You keep your customer happy. They keep coming back. Like, well, if I keep churning through people every so often, like that's not going to work either. Cause kind of the way I position the service is you get a small team of people, you get to know them, they get to know you. There's less explaining over time. Mm -hmm. So if I'm telling someone, oh, every three months we're replacing someone that kind of does not work. So knowing that my agents were getting taxed with that one client, I was like, I don't know if this is going to work because again, if my people are not happy, that's going to mean my clients are not happy and then nothing works out. Right. Right. All right. So, um, fantastic. I, I want to open this up a little bit. Um, you know, I'm not sure if any of you guys, uh, have any questions for Marie, but if you do, uh, I think there's a hand raising function, uh, feel free to raise your hand and I will call on you and uh, we'll get some questions answered. So uh, my man, Nathan, already has his Immediately. Hand <laughs> yeah, so uh, let's see, Nathan, uh, what you got? First and foremost, thanks for, you know, doing this, Maurice. You know, I'm a big fan of yours. Uh, you've been around from like basically day one. So, you know, it's great to see a family member, so to speak, uh, really come up and uh, I, I really admire your uh, consistency and work ethic. Thank uh, you. I my appreciate question, that. You're, you're welcome, my man. Uh, my question for you is, uh, do you stagger hours? Like, do you have hours that you offer the clients? Like, are you strictly nine to five? Or are you eight to eight? And if so, do you stagger some of your reps to cover different shifts? Uh, the answer is yes, I do stagger my reps. Um, we do 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. weekdays and 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. on the weekends. Uh, weekends is only one person handling calls. Uh, we have only one client that gets the bulk of weekend calls. The rest are like sporadic. So one person handling both days is totally fine. Um, in terms of weekdays. Do, do, you, do you charge uh, additional for weekend coverage? I do not. Nope. Okay. Yeah. My logic behind that was... If I can have you use more minutes, great. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Um, so no, no staggering on the weekends, but weekdays, it is staggered. I have right now, for, usually it's two agents that work in the morning and then two that work in the afternoon, um, twice a week. Uh, and I think you had actually said this in the course, Donald. Um, Mondays and Thursdays are actually the busiest days of the week. I don't know why Thursdays. I literally can't explain it, but <laughs> Thursdays, or the busiest day of the week. Um, so I have three people Monday and Thursdays in the morning, and then evenings, it's two people. Um, but in terms of how the shifts start, I have one person start at eight, one starts at nine, one starts at 10. And then in terms of ending, they also end one hour different. And then the afternoon shift, one starts at one starts at three, one starts at three and one starts at four, or maybe the other is four and then five. And then they both end at eight. Okay. Is, is one of the, if the person that worked the weekend, someone that it the third person in the morning on other days? Correct. Yep. Okay. We'll get that person pretty close to full time then. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, just a, a quick tip for you guys. Uh, you know, when you look for people, it's sort of harder to uh, one hire and two retain uh, employees that are working part-time hours. So whatever you can do to get them as close to full-time in general, unless they specifically ask for part-time. That's what uh, I was going to say. I have one person who works the afternoon who specifically wanted part-time because mm. um, she's also going to school while doing this. So she was like, if she can work three or four hours a day, that's perfect. And I'm like, great, you can do um, four to eight or five to eight, whichever one works. And like, that's what she's doing. Perfect, yeah. So yeah, it's nice. You know, when you happen upon someone with schedules of work, great. Um, but yeah, you, you know, I, I, I love what you're doing. Um, and so, you know, in terms of the, I, I do want to ask this because I, I think it's an important thing that I actually did not cover in the course. Mm -hmm. um, how does it work in terms of when someone says they want a dedicated agent, how do you typically approach that in terms of uh, implementation? So I would tell them, so I'll actually tell you essentially what happened with the first one who came in wanting shared agents and then said they wanted dedicated. Um, they wanted to use the same agents they used during the week trial. Um, they were like, oh, can I just get two of those to be my dedicated agents? And I was like, no, you cannot do that because <laughs> they're working with other clients right now. That would mean I'd have to backfill and train two people on like six different clients. Like that's not going to work. Um, so usually when someone wants a dedicated agent, I tell them I'll go find a new person for you um, as opposed to like converting a shared agent into a dedicated one. Okay. Yeah. Good. And again, that's just from an operational standpoint because not including the dedicated, the clients with dedicated agents, we have 21 clients. So to try and train someone in the week, to like ramp them up on even 10 clients in the week, I think would be difficult to maintain sort of quality. Mm -hmm. A lot easier to have one person and train them on one like heavier client. And, and when you're training, um, because the way I think of it, you know, what we did was essentially we were training them on what it means to answer calls properly in general, just have to etiquette down. And uh, also when we interview people, we look for a certain baseline of uh, professionalism and etiquette yep. on the phone. Uh, but the majority of training for us was, well, this is what each client wants. <laughs> and you're going to learn how, yes. like the particulars of each client. Right, that is usually what most of the training is. Um, the way my or onboarding works is they'll do like half a day watching 5.9 videos because 5.9 has all this like, you know, how to transfer a call, how to do this, how to do that, like how to use the phone system. Mm -hmm. um, then the other half of the day is essentially me talking with them. Like we do some test calls so they can actually like use the phone system. And then we start walking through the call script for every client. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because like you said, the biggest training part is this person wants calls answered this way. This one wants you to do this thing differently. Yes, you're booking appointments for both of these, but this <laughs> one wants you to like squeeze in appointments when possible. And this one does not want you to do that. Like that's really the, the training aspect. Right, right. And one uh, thing I will touch on, and you talk about like interviewing people for a certain baseline, mm -hmm. um, within the first like two minutes of an interview, I can usually already tell like, this person's a yes or a no. Yeah. Because if you ask someone like, oh, how's it going today? How's the weather? And they're like, it's good. It's sunny. You're like, you're not going to work. Like, <laughs> if you can't have small talk during an interview, like, I can't expect you to speak to 50 different strangers a day and be friendly. But if they're yeah. more like, oh, you know, it's nice and sunny here. I was just walking my dog. Oh, it was so nice having my coffee this morning. I'm like, you're going to work out. Like, you, I want you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, true. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of times where uh, it's much harder to have someone fight against their nature, their natural sort of, I don't know, uh, natural way of speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and if someone naturally is just a, a good conversationalist, that's most of the job. The other part of the job is just, uh, you know, particulars of clients. Yep. 
Um, all right, so uh, Nathan, I'm assuming that question was answered for you. And does anyone else have any other questions? If so, you know, raise your hand. And either way, Maurice, um, you know, uh, it's fantastic that you're on here. Um, one thing I'll say about you is that uh, you had a decent amount of questions, you know, coming into it. But a lot of this stuff that you're doing now, you just went off uh, and, and did. Like, you've been a pretty independent, uh, pretty independent owner operator. Yeah, I think I just became more comfortable or more confident with things in general, just as like as different scenarios come up. Um, Cause before I, you were right, like something would happen, I'd jump into the group, like, oh, how would someone handle this? Like, oh, someone come across this. Um, so yeah, just being exposed to more scenarios, I think has made me more comfortable with, okay, I think I'll do it this way because kind of the last time this is what happens. I'll just do this, do something similar. Yeah, right. just right, experience. Right. Okay, all right. Um, all right guys, so uh, if we don't have any other questions, again, uh, I appreciate everybody being here. Uh, again, most of all, Maurice, thank you for being here. And uh, we're gonna have this recording actually up on the YouTube channel. So uh, look out for that. If you missed anything or you want to, you know, sort of re go over anything, uh, Lauren said, just slide in Marisa DM. I don't know how <laughs> yeah. much. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can I can tell you firsthand that DM can get clogged pretty quickly. But uh, you know, uh, in general, especially within the tribe group, uh, Maurice is extremely helpful. So uh, thanks a lot, guys, for being here, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Sounds great. Thanks.